The idea of periodization is useful here. Periodization is a very old idea, but it's a fairly new word. Um, it's really just the idea of dividing or partitioning the past into chunks or into separate moments that each have their own sort of different identity. We're familiar with the, the period of the ancient world or medieval, medieval times. The Renaissance is a very you know, famous in most uh, art history. Uh, the Renaissance is a period. Uh, the Baroque may be different from the Renaissance, distinct from the Renaissance. Modernism itself occurs at a certain, in art history, occurs at a certain moment in time. And maybe even the postmodern is a period. Now, there's some risk with this idea of periodization. The risk is that you understand the period as a sort of homogeneous, uh, monolithic uh, moment based, you know, that produces like a single style or that produces a single way of thinking. So there's a, there's a risk in the notion of periodization of denying that the period has a diversity and a heterogeneity. But without some notion of period or in the, the differences in historical moments, in historical times, you really can't have history itself. The, the past would just seem like a sort of, sort of a random uh, array of, of, of individual events. So you need some notion of a period in order to do history itself. Today in this lecture, we're gonna use the periodization of a French philosopher, Jean Baudrillard. Now Baudrillard's periods, in terms of their date, in terms of time, are actually fairly standard. He has three periods that we'll talk about. The interest for us here is that he sees these periods as being defined by how we use signs and symbols, how, how we represent the reality or the historical reality to ourselves and to each other. Baudrillard characterizes his periods as what he calls three orders of the simulacra, or we could just think of three periods where the sign is used in different ways. The first order is what he calls imitation or counterfeit. And here the idea is that we can make representations that uh, refer to a, a, a reality, and we try to make those representations look like that reality. It's interesting that he gives the material of stucco as an example. Now, when you make an angel or a unicorn or some imitation, even if there's not a real thing like that in the world, if we don't actually see angels in the world, the angels still look like things we would expect to see in the world. They're made of stucco, which is, of course, an artificial material. Um, and, and the idea is that even though they look like things we might find in the world, we know that they're artificial. We know that they're imitations. So it's that slight difference between, uh, you know, seeing, you know, a real person and seeing a stucco angel. It's that slight difference that actually, in a way, paradoxically, assures us that reality is real and that these are imitations. So that's the first order of the sign or the first order of the simulacrum. The first order of the simulacrum occurs in time really from the Renaissance up until the Industrial Revolution. The second order of the simulacrum is what he calls production. And here, the, the beginning of the second order is sometimes around uh, the, the Industrial Revolution, when, when industrialized manufacturing becomes possible. Here, it's the ability to produce standardized objects, to reproduce the same thing over and over that characterizes uh, how we represent. Here, the whole notion of an original um, uh, goes away, or the, or the distinction between an original and a copy. Think of, think of photography, which is uh, um, a, a technique or a, or, or a technology that's part of the second order of the simulacra. Even though you might have a single authentic negative, there's no difference but in, in terms of the photographs uh, from one photograph to the next. There is no original photograph. Maybe in some way the negative still assures you that it's an imprint of, of the real itself, but there's no, there's no original, there are only copies. The mass-produced commodity, of course, is the paradigm for the second order of the simulacra. Ready-made cigarettes, Model T Fords, printed newspapers, all of these are products of production and reproduction. 
Of course, in architecture, architects start to make buildings with standardized building components. You get a lot of repetition, you get a lot of standardization uh, and sort of calibration. So architecture itself becomes uh, part of the order, the second order of sign. With production and reproduction, there's no longer any nostalgia for a disappearing natural order. All commodities, all, all standardized uh, uh, mass-produced goods are, are the same. So the value, the system of value here becomes a monetary system. How much is a commodity worth rather than how useful is something or how, or how uh, relevant symbolically uh, a stucco angel is. It becomes only a matter of, of the commodity's monetary worth in the second order. The difference in the first order and the second order can also be seen in the difference between an automaton and a robot. During the Renaissance, the late Renaissance, early Baroque, people used automatons to sort of imitate humans. They were often made by clockmakers, for example. They could move, they could play chess, they might even be able to write or to type. They had jerky movements. They would be the same size as a human, but their movements wouldn't be smooth, they would be jerky. So again, it was actually the difference between the automaton and the human that assured us that, in a way, that we were human and we weren't mechanical. Compare the automaton to a robot. A robot starts to be able not just to be like a human, not, not just to be a, a, a metaphor or a, an, an analog of the human, but it actually is able to begin to replace the human. A robots on an assembly line replace workers. So here the relationship between the human and the robot is on the order of equivalence or even replacement as opposed to uh, uh, analogy or likeness. Then Baudrillard says that the reigning order in our current lives, the third order of the simulacra, is what he calls simulation. What happens in simulation is that the very ability to distinguish between the representation and the real goes away. One of the best examples I think we could think of of, of the actual loss of a sense of a grounded reality comes in uh, the, the model of DNA. Let's say that biologically, uh, our very foundation, our, our reality at a molecular level has to do with the DNA. And yet Baudrillard reminds us DNA is a kind of writing. DNA is a code. So DNA in effect writes our bodies. So, so there's, no, there's no way of conceptualizing a reality that's deeper than that we can only conceptualize a system of representation that is the basis for our own bodies. This is the third order of the simulacra, when we lose the ability to distinguish the real from the simulation. We can see the effects of simulation in a lot of everyday examples. Think of reality TV. Is this television about a real situation or is it a total construction, a total simulation of a, of a reality that has no basis in, in reality? Another example that I like is, you know, at the ends of movies, in old movies, they used to put bloopers. They used to put outtakes. And then, of course, when movies became animations like Shrek, then the bloopers themselves are animated. So the very mistakes, you know, the real mistakes that were taken out are actually simulations of mistakes. Simulation even affects how we understand history. In simulation, the past cannot be recovered. We, we, we're not able to tr represent a true past. But at the same time then, the future is just being consumed. We, there's no way of projecting alternative futures. We, we sort of have to live in a suspended present. So then our sense of heightened expectation about the future, our sense of, of, of moving forward, have, having progress uh, starts to go away. There's a waning of, of affect. There's a loss of the sense of what is at stake in the future.